if your religious leader is asking you to commit mass suicide, you're probably in a cult. Many people know about cults. They know about what a cult kind of is. They have this idea of a cult. And sadly, the United States has been known for notorious cults throughout history. And in this video, we're going to be covering what I think are some of the top five most notorious cults. And then at the end, we're going to talk about some similar themes that they shared and some warning signs that people should look for if they think they might be caught in something that's cult-like at the very least. Um, so let's jump into it. A cult by definition is a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object. Typically in this, in, their, in most cases, it's either one single person or maybe one single group of people who basically, in most of these cases, are, think they're either a god or divinely inspired of some sorts. They think they're divinely inspired or they're, they're unable to be debated with because they have superior knowledge to everyone else, something like that. Typically in these scenarios, it's going to be normally just one person or maybe two people, but they they gather all this devotion from followers who think they they can never be wrong, basically, and they're just they fall after them. So let's talk about the top five most notorious cults and some of the most deadly cults in American history, and let's kind of just go through them and give an overview of them and share some facts. Number five I have on the list is Nexium. Now Nexium's kind of unique, so. Nexium had some sort of like new age spiritual element to it, but at the same time, it was a multi-marketing business is what it, it advertised itself as. So it was structured as a multi-marketing business, think like Amway or something like that, and it sold self-improvement. Now, self-improvement meant like mental, psychological, overcoming certain things. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't look into their philosophy too deep. Um, I didn't have too much interest in actually getting to know their philosophy, but they were structured as a multi-marketing business and you would take classes and courses on improving yourself and becoming, I think something along the lines of like more self-aware or um, becoming in tune with your mind. I forget how exactly they, what they, the end goal was, but it was some sort of new age stuff. Nexium, this multi-marketing scheme was run by a guy named Keith Rainier. So Keith Rainier, um, it started to come out that he wasn't necessarily running the best type of uh, multi-marketing platform. The Nexium movement fell apart when there was allegations of sexual abuse that got released, specifically when the New York Times article in 2017 released um, some reports that there's been sexual abuse, been branding, and other things going on within Nexium. And that's the big one. So there was women who were part of this subgroup within Nexium called DOS who got branded right around their pelvis area near their their genitals and they got branded and in the cases I listened to with the doc, in the documentary I listened to one of the people who one of the people who got branded said it was the initials of Keith um, which is kind of weird and later on Keith would be put on their prosecution or at least he would be uh, on trial for prostitution sexual abuse stuff and also racketeering and some other the business side of things and so the business quickly dissolved the moment Keith Rainier was under fire, and eventually he did get a, he did get sentenced to jail up to 120 years in prison. So Nexium was a multi-marketing cult. It was not a multi-marketing scheme because at the end of the day, Keith Rainier was revered revered as a sort of genuine intellectual. He was revered as basically all knowing, and he he was the one who formed this whole the whole Nexium self improvement plan. And he was seen as kind of like this genius genius above all geniuses. Uh, he, he was self-reportedly extremely smart. Um, so Keith Rainier was revered as this too, too big to handle intellect, and he ended up be, being just a manipulative sex trafficker, really, um, who slept with multiple women and uh, abused women. Now, number four is a well-known name, and this one it should not come as any shock if you look at most top 10, top five cult lists or whatever. Um, not in a positive way, in a negative way. But So number four, I have Charles Manson. Now, the reason why he's only number four on this list is because of the people who follow had a little bit more damage to their name. Um, but number four is Charles Manson. Now, Charles Manson is an interesting case because Charles Manson, even as a kid, was very troubled. He had a trouble. He grew up in a troubled household. His mom wasn't really the like, best. By what I understand, she was an alcoholic and even tried to sell off Charles Manson or stuff like that. And his uncle had to help him out. Charles Manson ended up going to juvenile detention when he was around 13, 14 years old, something like that and was reportedly raped multiple times and also reportedly raped multiple people himself, held 
some kids at knife point. He was not a uh, mentally stable dude, to say the least. He wound up going, being in and out of prison throughout his adult years for a little bit there. But in the 60s, he got out. And he was really uh, inspired, if you will, by the hippie movement and sort of the New Age philosophies and the sexual revolution that was going on. And so he started making relations with certain women. And he had this sort of appeal to the women, mostly because they were tripping on LSD, so they weren't necessarily thinking the straightest. Um, but eventually he garnered some support from a group of women, mostly. Um, he eventually did bring in a couple of men into his little cult thing. He garnered the attention of a select few women who basically revered him as some sort of guru sort of guy. I'm not sure if he saw himself as a god, but he definitely had this, he sort of had this like guru prof prophet vibe. As he traveled out west to, I think, California, um, he wanted to pursue this music career. He really thought he was going to become a rock star and become the next big thing. That was his goal. He actually made some decent connections, even some networking connections, even though he was kind of weird, but he had an anger issue and he didn't do the best with people who weren't women who just slept with him all the time. He tried to get his album pitched to certain people. He was even with a beach, uh, a beach boy for a while, um, but he ruined all his networking and all his chances because of his own pride and arrogance. His main time when he wasn't pursuing this rock star career was leading this cult that he had, these group of women mostly with some men occasionally coming in and out. Um, and what they would basically do is trip on LSD. Charles Manson would sort of share his philosophies and his thoughts and his prophecies or whatever you want to call them. And they would also have orgies and stuff as, as well. Because, you know, if you're a cult leader, that's apparently what you do. He ended up, as pressure started rising and as he started kind of falling apart really and losing stability, he moved into the desert had this whole helter-skelter thing that the world's going to be well, going to end by black people rising up and taking over the nation. It was a very racist, he was not very, he was a very racist person. So he had this idea that helter-skelter, this whole apocalyptic black revolution was going to happen in the States and that they had to hide out and all that stuff. Well, little say there was no black revolution. And so Charles Manson, to speed things up, as he will, um, had his some of his women and one of his men, I think, as well, go and kill a bunch of famous people. And he killed up, I think, to nine people, and he tried to blame it on the Black Panthers and some black groups, um, and everyone knew it wasn't them, and eventually he got arrested along with his women, um, followers, and things fell apart from there. So Charles Manson is notorious as a cult leader in America because he specifically attacked famous people and murdered famous people, up to about nine of them. So there's Charles Manson, a man revered as a guru, sort of prophet sort of guy um, and who engaged in a lot of orgies and LSD and also was a rock star, supposedly. Now, number three on this list are the Branch Davidians. Now, the Branch Davidians is an interesting case because they have, I think, a little bit more of a complex history. So, so Charles Manson is kind of straightforward, kind of how he progressed. Now, these are very glossed over overviews. Um, I might leave some the links in the description below for documentaries and stuff that are a little bit more insightful and a little bit more go into detail these stories. But just for this, we're going to go over the broad. So the Branch Davidians were kind of interesting. So the Branch Davidians to split off from a subgroup of the Seventh-day Adventists. So Seventh-day Adventists is a pretty big Christian denomination. There was a subgroup of that. I forget what the name was. But that subgroup, which was different than the mainstream Seventh-day Adventists, then eventually broke off into the Branch Davidians, who was initially led by... Benjamin Roden. So Benjamin Roden led the Branch Davidians to start. They lived in Waco, Texas, where they had a little commune. And following the death of Benjamin Roden, this guy named uh, David Koresh, well, that was a pseudonym. Um, his actual name was Howell. That was his last name, at least. Um, and he eventually took on the name of David Koresh later on. But for the sake of this video, I'm just going to call him David Koresh. David Koresh um, took a faction of the followers after Roden died because he thought of himself as basically Jesus reincarnate, coming back to the earth, and I forget exactly what his whole mission was coming back to this earth. That was what David Koresh claimed. He claimed to be God, basically, and God incarnate. And obviously, David Koresh, when you announce that you're God, you need to take all the women you possibly can. So he started to, he married a lot of the women within his faction, within the cult that he was leading. And a lot of them became his wife. He started bearing a lot of children with them and obviously engaged in a lot of that type of atmosphere. He also had sort of this idea of becoming a rock star. He was known for traveling out of his commune. He was like the only person allowed to travel out of the commune because he was the leader. And so he would travel out of his commune, do rock star store stunts, and 
these different things. So he also had sort of this rock star ambition to him. He uh, was mostly leading this commune, leading, leading this Branch Divinian commune, which eventually took over the Waco, Texas, Mount Car Carmel. So after he after Rodin died and he has faction, he left the commune and started his own commune. But then he eventually he returned back. Uh, in 1987, he returned back to the original commune to take it over. Ended up reportedly murdering uh, George Rodin, which I think was the son of Benjamin Rodin. Um, and then acquiring the commune again. So in 1993, there was reports of illegal activity, specifically the fact that they, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, were not abiding by proper gun rules, gun laws and regulations. And so the ATF got a warrant to check out the Branch Davidians because of these reports of illegal arm use uh, with guns. And it happened to be that they had a lot of guns, actually. There was a shootout when the ATF tried to go in, a bunch of federal agents died, so the FBI took over at this point. Now when the FBI took over, there was this long standoff between the FBI and the Branch Davidians. Uh, David Koresh did refuse to work with the FBI, he didn't want to go out, he didn't want to surrender. He had kept his followers in the commune for about, I think it was almost like, I think it was like 20-30 days that they were had this standoff. Well, eventually the FBI got impatient, so the FBI tried to pump the commune full of gas, and fires erupted within the building, gunshots were being heard, there was a lot of shooting going on, the building erupted, the commune erupted into fire, and about 76 Branch Divinians ended up dying in this, in this commune. And based on what they could see from the wreckage, some of them just burned to death, and others were shot. And they don't know if there was a suicide or if there was murder or exactly what happened. There were some survivors, but most of them died. But again, all these people thought David Koresh was Jesus incarnate, basically. They thought he Jesus came back and they thought he was God, a God man and had these prophecies. They would, reportedly, in the commune, they would have these hours and hours and hours long worth of meetings where David Koresh would just go up there with a Bible and he would just start ranting about his philosophies and his teachings and who he was. And then the Branch Davidians would listen to him. And anything he said was divine word, basically. that You could not challenge it. He was, he was superior. He was godlike. He was divine. And so he was above everyone else. He was above being challenged. And apparently, according, there was reports also of child abuse and other things because he was in control of whatever he wanted, he got. And you couldn't really challenge him. Second on my list is Heaven's Gate. Now, Heaven's Gate could have probably been third as well, but I think it's just sort of uh, an interesting case because they were one of the longest lasting ones. They lasted for about 30 to 40 years before their big event, and I'll get into that. So the cult started in 1974, roughly, when two people named Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite decided to team up together to travel America to warn about this apocalypse, end of the world type stuff. They would call themselves Tea and Doe. And that's what they ended up becoming called. But these two leaders basically led this sort of new age religion, sci-fi, ufology, sort of religion that also incorporated the Bible. They basically proclaimed to be the two prophets from Revelations in the scriptures and then traveled America talking about how, you know, the world is going to come to some sort of end or close or uh, they need to move on to the next level, which is like heaven. Um, and so there was this whole idea of escaping this world and if this world in a way was evil or not fit for survive for living and that they need to move on to the next world. Now, unlike the ones we so far, we covered so far, Heaven's Gate was that it was a chaste cult. So you weren't allowed to engage in sex. You weren't allowed to engage in sexual activity because it was carnal or it was fleshy. It wasn't supposed to be, it wasn't, you weren't supposed to engage in those things. Actually, there was even reports of the, some of the men getting castrated. Um, in the cult because they didn't want to desire sex anymore because of what the cult leaders demanded. And so they, they said, I don't want to be tempted anymore to have sex. I want to get castrated. And so some of the men got castrated, I think, including Apple, ba uh, Apple White, who did so too. But yeah, so they believed in this idea of extraterrestrial life and some sort of weird ufology with Jesus and some weird things as well. But they traveled the States and eventually got to the point where Bonnie ended up dying, one of the leaders ended up dying from cancer, which really threw a wrench into everything because they were supposedly, Applewhite and Bonnie were, according to themselves, self-reportedly, basically gods. They were gods from heaven. They were, according to themselves, prophets from Revelations. They were basically immortal. They were superior in knowledge. 
and you weren't they weren't you weren't supposed to ask them questions in the sense of challenging them you were supposed to take learn from them and they led this whole routine like when they traveled they had this whole routine these whole lessons and they taught the people what they believed about themselves and if you you could only ask questions to the point where you would agree with them uh, you weren't really able to challenge them again and there's survivors from uh, from this cult who reported that and i i listened to a whole documentary on it it's very interesting uh, but yeah they thought they had superior knowledge and people followed them which ended up leading to the point where Applewhite, being the only leader left after Bonnie died from cancer, decided that we're not immortal flat in the flesh. This involves some sort of consciousness, and so he took his new age idea about the body and consciousness and kind of formed a little bit, adapted to religion a little bit. And it got to the point where he basically said, well, we're not fit for this earth, we need to leave. And then there was this comet called the, what was it called, Hale Bop Comet, that was coming in, that was a big report in the 1990s sometime, I forget when, uh, but sometime in the 1990s you had the hale Bob Comet, and Applewhite said, there's our ticket. Behind that comet is a UFO, and we're going to commit suicide together, and we'll, our consciousness will ascend to the UFO, and we'll be taken to the next level or to heaven or whatever. Uh, as a lot of people may know about this cult, it ended up ending with about 39 of the members committing mass suicide, about, I think, five to ten at a time, they would drink poison, cover themselves in sheets, so forth, um, to join the UFO on the back of this comet, reportedly. And again, there was this idea that one man had this divine revelation. He didn't really need to prove himself, um, or the way he did prove himself was through either weird prophecies or mysticism um, and stuff like that. Um, and so that is my number two on the list. Now, number one should be probably no surprise to anyone who knows anything about cults is Jonestown, um, People's Temple, run by Jim Jones. So, Jim Jones, interesting man, interesting man. Jim Jones ran the, he started the People's Temple, which uh, ended up becoming Jonestown. But he started the People's Temple in America. And he started, I forget in what state, but eventually became really big in California. So, he went to California with this idea of the People's Temple. And Jim Jones was not a Christian himself. He um, started off as some sort of weird, like, Pentecostal, I think. I think he started off in that sort of realm um, within Christianity. But then, basically, when he was in California and started growing bigger, he rejected Christianity and its tenets and its norms. And he kind of made his own little socio socialist religion thing. Jim Jones kind of also revered, he revered himself as some sort of either prophet or god or angel-like man. He was superior in knowledge, superior in leadership divine revelation he had all the answers basically and he specifically targeted vulnerable people he would go to black communities which was this was during like the 60s 70s era he would go to black communities and he would appeal to them by trying to treat their needs and get them to the people's temple but when they got into the people's temple they would basically be blackmailed to stay and they would be abused and other people he got he would help the poor he would help the needy but the moment they joined the people's temple for a little bit it was a little bit healthier but after a while, he became power hungry and he blackmailed the people and abused them and kept them into the people's temple um, and forced their hand not to leave. And if you did leave, you'd get harassed or you had a fear of being excommunicated, a, a bunch of different things. And so there was this power scheme going on with Jim Jones. But he also had connections with the police, with pol politicians. He was a big influential man. His people's temple at one point had like over a thousand people attending. He was very, very popular. He was very, very charismatic and he was very well known for being influential and manipulative and he also sucked the money out of his congregants he was he was constantly saying like i am the man and he demanded money and demanded money and he also uh, again like any good cult leader does he took a lot of the women and he made them his wives or he had affairs or he was sleeping in there and there but other followers that were at the people's temple had to go through him and ask for permission to marry people and he had to control everything he was a micromanager but eventually word got out to the federal government and to people started leaking out news that he was a very abusive man. There was sexual abuse, child abuse. And so Jim Jones decided to, when the pressure got hot, to go down to South America into, um, I think, Ghana or something like that. Ghana. Yeah, Ghana. He decided to go down to South America into Ghana and start his own little commune. Now, it's also important to note that Jim Jones' particular rise to fame was through miracles, quote unquote. He would basically fake miracles. For instance, he would have there would be moments where he would have congregants in the mem 
people in the congregation have quote unquote a tumor in their throat or something, he would like pray over them. They would cough up some sort of like turkey gizzard or lizard, a turkey, like a, a, a body part of another animal. And they would like cough it up and make it look like a tumor. Or he would have people pretend to die and then he would raise them to life. Or he would, and he did a lot of stunts like that. He was some sort of miracle worker, quote unquote. He was, that's why he could sell himself as a god. But when he moved the people down to Jim to Jonestown in South America, he claimed that he lost his power. Um, he started this sort of social. He started this socialist community down there, which ended up becoming basically a place for people to starve and become slave labor. It was not well regulated. It was very poorly run, and he was taking all the money. He all the money, all the women, everything was his. And he claimed he would obviously give reasons, excuses for all of this. But he ended up getting over 900 people to come down to South America. But the federal government again got word that things were going bad down there, that there was abuse, all these American citizens were being held against their will. Make a long story short, there was a shootout down at South America. Jim Jones got word about it, and he got word that the federal government's going to be intervening and coming in Jonestown. So he got all of Jonestown together and forced them to drink poison, Kool Aid, and whoever didn't partake in the mass suicide got shot. Um, so over 900 people ended up dying that day. It's a very tragic story. Um, and one of the worst cults ever to exist in American history. Why do I cover all this? Why did I, why did I cover this? Why did I emphasize certain points of these cults is because there are certain correlations between these. The most important one being there's either one or two people at the top calling the shots who are beyond all debate. And there's, they lack humility. And that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest indicator if you might fear that you're in some sort of cult. You might fear that you're in some sort of bad and bad religious environment. It doesn't have to be religious. In the case of Nexium, it wasn't really a religion. So if you're just in some sort of bad environment or group, something to look for is, is there one leader or one group of people who are beyond rebuke, who are beyond correction and criticism? Because if there is, that's a bad sign. Humans are infallible. Humans make mistakes. Humans are wrong. We we say things that are dumb. We're not. We don't know everything. And so, whenever there's someone who is above everyone else, and is beyond rebuke, beyond criticism, and lacks humility, that's a sign that you're in some sort of cult-like religion or cult-like group. Um, and that's something to look out for. Because all of these groups, there was one or two leaders, and they were beyond criticism. Now, moving on to another point that's important, is that they all invo involved some sort of... They all were obviously controlling. They used blackmail techniques or uh, manipulative techniques. So, for instance, in Jim Jones' case, he would use blackmail, where like, if you would leave, I will reveal to people that you did this, or that you slept with me. Um, or, you know, if you leave, I'll beat your brother, you know, stuff like that. He would blackmail and use abuse for leverage. Um, likewise, you also had, um, people like Nexium also leverage where they, they would literally ask for blackmail to join the group, like sending nudes and stuff. And then they would release those if you, if people left or stuff like that. So they would use blackmail and manipulating techniques to keep people in the group, um, and not basically make it difficult for people to leave. So again, if people are using techniques like that in a group that you're in, that's not good. That's another bad sign that you might be in some sort of group that is cult-like. Now, another one is interesting is that they all involve sex somehow. Now, four out of the five involve sex in a promiscuous way. So the leaders, either A, to, basically almost always boils down to A, the leaders have all the favors when it comes to sex. They're the ones who have all the sexual pleasures and they're the ones who have access to whatever sexual stuff they want and they do that. Or the leader at least, even maybe he doesn't have all of it, but he has a lot of it and he calls the shots and he, make, he or she makes the determination of who or what can engage in what. Um, it's very, very much like that. And the unique case is Heaven's Gate, but... They also, the leaders did say you can't have any and even castrated people have people, people wanted to be castrated, I guess. So they would have people castrated. So 
it was just kind of the reverse, but they still dictated to a full extent what could be done um, beyond just traditional, normal sexual morality you might find in regular religions. This was much more controlling, much more manipulative, and much more looking over your shoulder and abusive in nature. Um, and obviously very selfish in the case of men, male leaders wanting all the sexual favors. It's just a very, um, very abusive. Now, there's also another one with dogma without evidence. So if you would listen to kind of these cases, and I listen to a lot of documentaries on these different cults, they would use very tenuous evidence for what they believe. Um, either A, they would quote scriptures in the case of like Heaven's Gate. They would quote scriptures like Revelations. One, one, Revelations is very subject to interpretation anyway, just in and of itself. But two, they would just quote verses by themselves. They wouldn't quote full passages. They wouldn't quote chapters. They would normally just quote verses in themselves. They wouldn't look at historical context. They wouldn't do any sort of deep analysis into the religion they were quoting. They would just use it if it was convenient. They would also use either experiences or like things about to happen. Like, so instance, the hale Bob comment in the case of Heaven's Gate, they would say, they said, oh, the Hale-Bob's come is coming on this day. This must be, this isn't just a coincidence. This is a sign. But a sign of what exactly? So they would use very weak evidence, but promote very strong dogmas that were irrefutable. If you, if you refuse, if you criticize the leader or if you'd made any sort of good challenge, you would be shut down and shamed. And so again, that goes back to the humility factor. And so if you see some, if you see one leader, one man dictating pretty much everything and forcing it onto the masses that follow him and they're beyond criticism, beyond questions, and they're not using good evidence to support why they believe what they believe. It's just mostly assertions. Or if you don't believe me, then you'll suffer punishment. That's another bad sign that you might be in some sort of cult-like structure. Um, but yeah, so those are some of, the, some of the things that I've noticed looking at these cults. It's just cults intrigue me. Because it's like, how does how does one get sucked into those? But people do, and a lot of times the people who do are aren't people you would expect to be. I mean, in, in the case of Nexium, a lot of them were educated, a lot of them were uh, middle class, upper middle class, and so it's sometimes surprising who gets wind up in cults. But it's important to at least know the signs of cults, and it's important to know know what you're looking for if you ever get suspicious or you think you're in a dangerous situation because they're still going on today. They're still cults that go on today there's still people who try to manipulate others and these are and cults are just well known for manipulation and unlike traditional religion which tends to be more thoughtful tends to um, ask the questions and, and normally promote some sort of humility cults don't they, they they don't they are very much more dogmatic in their assertions without thought so hopefully you guys got something from that hopefully you guys enjoyed it and it was informative if you like this video Press the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. Uh, I would love to have you. And now, friends, go out there and light the world and don't join a cult. Or start one, for that matter. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.